Good morning. How's everybody doing? Could you believe the weather yesterday? Yes, yes. Oh, I tell you, after the after the cold and the rain and the dark, and then to just see the the sun, the sun. There's a sun. So uh, we're going to celebrate like we do every Sunday. We're celebrating the goodness of God and the, that God has done great things for us. He is a good God, no matter what we're going through. He has done great things and will continue to do great things. Let's stand together. One, two, three. You can clap your hands if you want to. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Yes, He has. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero! Oh, hero of heaven! the grave to free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things with dancing your freedom awaken your life oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and i know you will do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things god you do great things oh hero of heaven things in each of our lives and Lord we know that uh, at times our journey is difficult and yet you never leave us you never forsake us you carry us we follow you Lord you have done great things how we praise you on this morning. You 
Thank you. 
you pour out our praise.
nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. Have no rival, you have no equal now and forever. God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the seated. Amen. What a beautiful name. What a powerful Lord. Lord God we have. I want to release the children now to go to Children's Church and uh, they're watching the Jesus film, Children's Version, up until Easter, which is in two weeks. So uh, just prepare your hearts as we Continue and go into the Easter week and um, just ask God to, to use, use you. To say, Lord, use me. Use me each day. So uh, we want to have the ushers come forward right now. We're going to take our tithes and our offerings. Ushers, take the offering.
have a special friend here this morning. He's preached, uh, I think, once before. And uh, interesting enough that uh, we were on the same staff in Riverside, California, at a church called The Grove. And so we have known each other for 30 years, but we have become really much better friends, and I, we know each other way better uh, since we both ended up in Seattle. So uh, let's welcome uh, Kerry Warren. He's, he's on staff at North Point Community Church in Kirkland. Good morning, church. <laughs> there, there we go. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> um, as Jeff said, my name's Kerry, and uh, yeah, Jeff and I go way back. We've known each other for 30 plus years. I am the younger one of the two of us, so um, I'm kidding, Jeff. I'm kidding. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be back here this morning uh, to get an opportunity to, to meet you folks and to speak this morning. And a little bit about myself in case uh, you weren't here the last time I spoke, but uh, I'm married. My wife and Susan and I will be celebrating our 40th anniversary this coming uh, June. So we're super excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, we both got married when we were 10. So uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have two children. Uh, a boy and a girl. We have five grandchildren, and uh, the grandchildren keep us super busy. For those of you who have grandchildren, you know what I'm talking about, but they are a huge blessing, and we love them to death, and we spend just about every time, every moment we can uh, hanging out with them. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we have, uh, you know, as Jeff said, I, I serve over at North Shore Community Church over here in Kirkland, uh, and I oversee our facilities operations in IT uh, stuff and building development and campus developments and things like that. Super fun. Prior to that, I was an executive pastor for several years uh, in and around the area. And prior to that, as Jeff said, I was in Southern California. I did 20 years of family ministries, overseeing everything from new birth all, uh, birth all the way through uh, high school and overseeing a midweek uh, uh, day, uh, preschool and all kinds of fun stuff and have loved doing that. And prior to that, I worked for Boeing Corporation. I was in aerospace in Southern California and uh, all the time volunteering, working in the church. And I've been in every facet of church ministries <laughs> except women's. So uh, I have spoke at women's events, uh, but I have not been volunteer at women's <laughs> events. But uh, God called me into ministry a long time ago and uh, loved it ever since. I have not looked back. In fact, my son's a youth pastor over at Alderwood just around the corner here. Uh, and my daughter's on the worship team at her church down in Enumclaw. And so we are super, super blessed uh, to, to have those kids and what they do for, for God. Uh, but today I want to talk about, I heard this story once and, uh, about a lawyer who bought a very fancy, very expensive car. And he was so excited to show it to his colleagues and his friends when all of a sudden an 18-wheeler came out of nowhere, careening out of control and took out the driver's side door of his brand new car with him standing right there. And he just screams, no, because he knows no matter how good of a mechanic he finds, it is, that car is never going to be the same. And pretty soon a, a, a policeman rolls up and, and the lawyer begins to yell at the policeman. He goes, did you see that this foolish driver ruined the car, my door and my car? And the policeman looks at him and says, you're, you're a lawyer, aren't you? And he goes, yes, what does that have to do with my car? And he goes, oh, you, you lawyers are all the same. You're all materialistic. You're just worried about your possessions. I'll bet you didn't even notice that your left arm is missing, did you? And he looks down, my Rolex! <laughs> and so I tell that story this morning. Because it's a story I can relate to, and maybe you can too. At times where we get so caught up in our possessions and what we have, and we struggle with that at times. And it is no doubt a side effect of the culture and the society in which we live that prizes material possessions, that says you need to have acquire more and more and more. And today we're going to take a look at a passage in scripture that talks about, it's a parable that Jesus talks about, where he talks about this farmer who was foolish with his riches. He had a recollection problem. This farmer just, he remembered the wrong things and forgot the right things. 
And so if you have your Bible with you this morning or an app on your phone, would love for you to turn to Luke chapter 12. We're going to start Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 13. It's going to be up here on the screen as well. But Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And this is called the parable of the rich fool. Verse 13. Are you there? All right. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Verse 18, then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be, whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word and the truths that it holds. And God, I just pray right now as we dive into your word this morning that you would teach us something new about you, something new even about ourselves. And we'll give you the praise for it, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make my brother divide the inheritance. Starting in verse 13, it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge and arbiter between you? Now, I don't know about the, you, if you can picture this, but here Jesus has been teaching for some time, and large crowds of people gather to hear him speak because he speaks with one who has wisdom and authority. When all of a sudden, in the middle of Jesus talking about the kingdom of God, out in the back, a young man calls out and interrupts the whole thing with a question. And it's really not even a question. It's more of a statement that he wants Jesus to straighten out his legal affairs. It's rude. It's out of place. And the man who is calling out, he sounds like a younger brother in this instance. He doesn't feel like he's getting his due. Now, back in the culture then, when the father passed away, the inheritance went to the oldest son, who then, if it was property, the family would work it together until he died, and it would pass to his oldest son. But what it sounds like here is this younger brother doesn't feel like he's getting his fair share. Does it sound familiar? It sounds familiar to me because I think there's times when I feel like I'm not getting what's due me. I deserve this. And that's what this younger brother is, is demanding. And he wants Jesus to take care of it for him. In the parable that follows, Jesus talks about how this farmer has a memory deficiency. He remembers the wrong things and forgets the right things. And like a lot of us, this parable starts out with a man who wants Jesus to solve a problem for him, right? And we want God to solve our problems, and it's partially the right thing to do, isn't it? God said, cast your cares and your burdens on me. And Jesus wants us to come to him to help, uh, have him help us solve our problems. But sometimes it's easy to get caught up and think, God, he's just like a genie. We take him out of, the, out of the lamp, genie grant me my wishes, and then sometimes we put him back. But this request here in this parable isn't about, or this passage, isn't about a petty probate case. It's really not. But the man wants Jesus to solve his problems, but like us, sometimes he doesn't want Jesus to so- change our heart. We want Jesus to solve our problems. 
But sometimes we don't want him to change our heart. And this man had already decided what he wants, and he wants Jesus to do it. He wants Jesus to see it his way. It's kind of like my grandkids. I told you I have five grandkids. And when they want that treat or that cookie, they can't have it. And they try to convince me how they should have this treat and this cookie. And it's, they work at it, and they know in their mind they should have it, and they work, and they work, and they, they beg, and they beg. And quite honestly, I usually end up giving it to them anyway, truth be told. But that's what this man wants. Uh, he owes it to me. I deserve it. Tell him to give me my share of the inheritance. And this man is willing to circumvent the system to have Jesus take care of what is obviously should be taken care of by the local judge. But he wants Jesus to do it instead. And Jesus tells him, I'm not the judge here. I'm not the judge here. And he lets the man know it. And the, but instead of Jesus shutting this man down, Jesus turns it into a teachable moment. And he turns it into this teachable moment. Now, before I go any further, is it wrong to pursue financial justice? No, it's not. But the main issue in this passage is not about the wealth, but rather it's about the attitude to obtaining the wealth. It's about the attitude. This man's heart, it was tied up in his inheritance. And he had this folly of being preoccupied with riches. At the heart of the matter is greed. At the heart of the matter with this man is greed. And the Greek word used here literally means a desire to have more. I want more. And then the key verse here, the key verse is verse 15, where he says to them, watch out. Now, any time you hear somebody tell you, watch out, usually means there's danger coming, right? I tell my grandkids, watch out. Something's, you know, something bad could happen. When Jesus tells you to watch out, you better heed. And he tells the people, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And so my first point today is this. Today we measure people largely in terms of possessions. Today we measure people largely in terms of possessions. Because in today's culture, in, in our world, the culture tells us to grab all that you can. Go for the gusto, right? Right? Take what's yours. Because culture will tend to hoard possessions because the culture believes that, that, that this life, that's all that there is. It's all that there is. It's that uh, age-old expression, perhaps you've heard it, he who dies with the most toys wins, when in reality, he who dies is dead, right? Right? It's the same thing. In fact, there was a, one time, uh, there was a quote. John D. Rockefeller was once asked, when is enough money enough? And it was reported that he said, when I have one dollar more. And sometimes that's the way our culture can be. And we get sucked into that as Christians. We get sucked into the culture of what, I need just one more of whatever that is. And the Bible, now hear this, the Bible is not against possessions. When viewed and used properly, it's not against it. Having an abundance of things is not the key to a successful life either. And Jesus warns that an abundance of things could make a person a failure. Now, in this instance, it was natural for Jesus to use an agricultural uh, example to his audience because they would get it. But I would imagine if Jesus were giving that same parable today, he would probably use maybe your 401k, your bank account, your investments. But using this parable, Jesus takes agriculture and uses an everyday example to teach a spiritual truth. 
and, he, and his audience gets it. So my next point today, I'm going to talk about, Jesus is warning about all kinds of greed. All kinds of greed. It wasn't just money, possessions, fame. He says, watch out, be on your guard for all kinds of greed. All kinds. But in this parable, it's really about our attitude towards wealth that's in question here. And Jesus' words rang against the culture then, just as they do today in the 21st century. Because today, we can be preoccupied as a culture with wealth. And then, at times, we can lose sight of God. I know it's happened to me. We work and we work to acquire more and more and more. And our culture strives for us to do that. But God said, cease striving and know that I am God. I remember reading that somewhere. Now, Jesus also points out that the man is a fool, which I love that. Jesus points out he's a fool. And only one other time in Scripture is the word fool used. It's in Psalms, and it refers to God deniers. Jesus calls this man a fool. So why is he a fool? Well, first, in the parable, he misused the wealth that God had given him. Did you catch the parable where Jesus says a certain rich young farmer, a rich farmer? Did you catch that? So the man already had wealth. And he thought, this farmer thought, he had done it. But the parable goes on to say, the ground yielded an abundant harvest, implying God. It doesn't say that the farmer worked really hard, he massed all this stuff, he accumulated a great fortune, and he made it, and he was successful. His blessing was from God, but yet he forgot to remember that. This farmer beheld his bumper crop, and he didn't see that the hand of God. He saw only himself. And my next point this morning is greed can blind us. Greed can blind us. Matthew 19, 24 says this. <clears throat> doesn't say coughing. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Wealth can trap us into self-absorption, materialism. It can even help, cause us to be insensitive towards others. 1 Timothy 6.10 also, it says this. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evils. Growing up in California, I remember uh, in California when the lottery came out. Lottery in California is a long time ago, but the lottery came out. And, and statistically, I don't remember the numbers exactly. It's been, a, uh, it's been a long time. But statistically in California, when people hit the lottery, where they hit a million dollars or more, right? They're, now they're classified as a millionaire. The vast majority of those people ended up squandering all that money and ended up dying in poverty, ending up on, on government assistance and welfare because they lost sight. Now, God does not teach that money is evil or that things produce evil. God's not teaching that. It is the way we choose to use them. Let me say that again. God does not teach that money in itself is evil or that things produce evil. It is the way we choose to use them. God desires us to be happy, to have possessions, or why else in Exodus would he say, thou shalt not steal if you didn't have possessions? God desires us to be happy, happy. But yet wealth is no measure of worth. In our society, the more wealthy you are, it signifies worth. And that is not the case. Wealth is not a measure of your worth. And having a lot of money does not make a person worthy. Nor does being in poverty mean a man is not worthy. So money does not mean that you're worthy. But in this parable, as we can do in our society, in our culture, even as Christians, we can tend to pile things up. And in this parable, this farmer is piling things up. 
But yet, there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has given us. There's nothing wrong with that. And let me say that again. There's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has given us. But in this case, as is sometimes in ours, at least in mine, we are working towards such a scenario. We accumulate and we accumulate in hopes that one day, one day, we'll be able to take it easy. One day. But in this case, in this chapter, in this verse in Luke, God isn't factored in. I want to share 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. So 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19 says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Did you catch verse 17? Everything for our enjoyment. God wants us to use possessions and our things for his direction, at his direction, for the health and well-being, not only of our families, but also to promote God's truth. But this man in this parable didn't have God first. He forgot the important things, the right things, and remembered the wrong things. And now, also, in this parable, Jesus doesn't say to give it all away either. So don't hear that. Jesus didn't say to give it all away either. So my next point is this. The key is we must keep God first. Got to keep God first. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Keep God first. The man in this parable, he had uh, eye trouble. He had eye trouble. Because he comes to view as everything is his. His. It's become his. Five times in verses 17 through 19, he speaks of what I will do as if he owns it all. What I will do. And then he speaks of what I will. I have my crops, my goods, my soul. Five times he's lost sight of who God is. But in James 4, 6, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And this man had become proud. The farmer was being proud of what he had done, and in his arrogance, he thought only of himself. And I know I've been guilty of that. He forgot what God had done and remembered only what he thought he had done. Because all of it, gang, everything we have belongs to God. And in this parable, he thought, this rich farmer thought that this would insulate him from life's hardships. Acquiring more wealth, gang, doesn't insulate you from life's hardships. Sometimes it may mean you can buy your way out of it or pay somebody else to get you out of it, but it doesn't insulate you from life's hardships. And in this parable, even all this wealth that this man had in this parable couldn't buy him more time because that very night he would die. There's a, a, a Spanish proverb that says, there are no pockets in a shroud. There are no pockets in a shroud. Now, the second reason this farmer was a fool was that the, his faith was in his possessions. It became his. The crop that he had was his, was his possession, and that was his safety. This man thought his success was in the abundance of things that he had acquired. He thought, ah, my troubles will be over. I'll eat, drink, be merry, I'll take it easy. But Jesus is pointing out that that was only going to make him a failure in the, in the end. Now, God wants us to, as I said, God wants us to enjoy the gifts that we have, that he gives us. It's just like your kids on Christmas Day. Remember that? When you give the kids that Christmas present, that very expensive toy, and they rip it open, and they, what do they want to do? Play with the box, right? <laughs> so we want, God wants us to enjoy the gifts that we have. So my next point this morning is, do material blessings draw you closer to God? Do they draw you closer to God? Does what you have 
and who you are draw you closer to God. You see, material blessings of life are either a mirror in which we see ourselves or a window in which we see God. Let me say that again. Material blessings of life are either a mirror in which we see ourselves or it's a window through which we see God. I will share this story with you, uh, how this affected me as far as material blessings is uh, way back in the year 2000. Uh, Dodge came out with this car called the Intrepid. And uh, I had to have this car. It was a, very, it was a nice car. It was, it was kind of sporty looking. And I had to have this car. I, maybe it was a midlife crisis thing. I don't know. But I, I had to have this car. And so uh, I bought it. And I took care of this car. I washed it all the time. It was kept clean. It was whack. I mean, all the time. My kids couldn't sit in it unless they were disinfected and hosed off with a pressure washer and uh, no food in the car. You know, none of that. In fact, I wouldn't even let my wife drive the car. I don't even think she, she didn't drive it once. That became my possession. It became a symbol for me. And then three months after I bought this car, <clears throat> sitting in stop-and-go traffic in Southern California, as it's always that way, when I looked up in the rearview mirror, so when I stopped in traffic coming home from my son's soccer game, and I looked up in the rearview mirror just to see a work truck barreling, uh, barreling into me, I had nowhere to go. This work truck, uh, big truck, hit me doing about 35, 40 miles an hour, and I was in a dead stop. Now, my car, this car had, had, had a uh, low-profile tires, you know, the little, little yeah, and the, the sports suspension, it was low to the ground. It was really, oh, it was nice. And the force of this impact shoved the car into the pickup truck in front of me. I'm low. Launched me under the pickup truck. It landed on the hood of my car. Airbags go off, Right? I hit, the, I hit the airbags in the steering wheel so hard, the force of the impact. When I came back, I broke the driver's seat. And I was staring up at the ceiling of the car looking around going, when did I take up smoking? All the dust and everything. Now, I tell that story because God said, you know what? You love that car? Totaled it. Totaled it. Three months. I hadn't even gotten the license plates yet. So I tell you that because, you know, if we love God and we put him first in our lives, then whatever material blessings we receive will only draw us closer to him. I didn't put a lot of prayer in it. Do I, God, should I buy this car? What should, you know, what, I just had to have it, and I became selfish about it. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoyment either, enjoying what God has given us. I want to, I want to repeat that because God wants us to enjoy the blessings of life. That's my next uh, one of my points. God wants us to enjoy the blessings of life. There's nothing, gang, there's nothing spiritual about sitting around like Eeyore, sitting in a corner. Oh, these things won't last anyway. Why enjoy them? No. But really, my challenge for us today is do we invest or do we spend? Are you making a living are you making a life? Are you making a living or are you making a life? Colossians 3.23 says, "Work Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Work for the Lord. The man in this parable thought, ah, I can take it easy. I got it made. Is your peace based on things or is it based on God? And the farmer was basking in false success. False satisfaction only encourages false success, and both encourage false security. This farmer was successful in the world's eyes, but not in God's. Because wealth will either be your servant or your master. That passage in Matthew, will either be your servant or your master. Now, the last part of the parable was this. is He says, be rich towards God. Be rich towards God. We are to be rich in spiritual things that will last and not in material things that won't last. And one spiritual treasure is good deeds. Loving others, sharing what you have, showing mercy, showing grace. Another spiritual faith is uh, a spiritual treasure is faith. Faith knowing that God provides all things. And to get this, we must determine if we really want them 
or not? And are we really willing to put God first? Matthew 6.21, it talks about where if you think more about your home, your car, your vacation, your bank account, your investments than God, you're building up treasures on earth. Because Matthew 6.21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So do you have faith in God or faith in possessions? Gang, Abraham was a wealthy man in the Old Testament. Yet he still walked with God and lived a life of faith. So this morning, I want to leave you with this famous quote from an old guy named Will Rogers. The quickest way to double your money, fold it over, put it back in your pocket. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for the possessions and the things that you provide for us, God. And may we never lose sight of where they come from, and that is you. Whether it's a, a dollar or it's a million dollars, God, our homes, our families, our, our things that we have, our clothes, God, all that we have, may we never lose sight of where it comes from, and that's from you. Jesus, thank you so much for giving up the possession of your life here on earth for us, for dying on that cross so that, God, we can have life and have it abundant. Thank you for teaching us what it means to really, truly Keep focused on the kingdom and not on ourselves. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Carrie. Awesome words, brother. Let's stand. There's a song that just really pertains that just when I saw Carrie's uh, topic and notes and uh, this week, and uh, God just brought this to, to, to mind. And you know it. It's... Let's sing it together. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus, and when I am alone, and when Jesus. Elvis, you want to come forward? Elvis has uh, one of our elders. He has a few announcements before we leave. Hello, brothers and sisters. How's everyone? I have a couple of announcements. We have an annual meeting, so don't forget March 24, if you're a member. 
So be here. So we're going to be talking about everything that is happening in the church, uh, elections, uh, financial stuff. So remember the 24th, uh, 11, after service. That's when we're going to do it. What else do we have? So Good Friday, March 29, 6 p.m. as well. That's another activity that we're going to be having. Uh, and what else? <laughs> Easter Sunday. I know JJ, uh, Pastor JJ is really excited about Easter Sunday. So March 31st, Absolutely. 1045. And remember, that's not the uh, Easter bunny. Uh, so I don't know if you guys were excited. It was like, well, we're going to get to. So probably the kids, but not you guys. Okay? <laughs> so remember, Easter is not about the Easter bunny. All right. So, and this is another thing that I want to talk to you about. Uh, we're, today, we're having a, a combined youth event. So we started uh, this event combined with other churches around our neighborhood. So there was about three of us that we started uh, coming together since we were not a lot of, you know, uh, youth in, in our group uh, at this moment. We came together so we can have a bigger group. We can have uh, much fun when we do the activities. And also we have a, a, you know, a sermon. One of the leaders, you know, shares with our youth uh, a little bit of sermon. So, you know, and they bring uh, their friends and they get to hear the word of God while doing, uh, you know, activities. So to, today we're having one at 5 o'clock and it's going to be laser tag. It, it does have a cost. It has $10 because we're having a professional company take care of everything. Uh, so, but if you have somebody, if you're interested, today you can still, you know, come, 5 o'clock. It's going to be here in our church. And now we are about seven churches. We started about 30 students, and we are over 100 now. So, and that was the idea, you know, to get... People were excited and uh, participated. You know, our, our sister church, uh, Mosaic, you know, is also uh, a part of that. Uh, they're kids from Seattle, the ones that are here. They come to that event as well. And, uh, and actually, you know, our uh, pastor, uh, Garrett, is the one who's going to be sharing uh, tonight. So if you want to hear him preach a little bit, so he's going to be doing that today. And... Uh, I just want to also close with this. The scripture says in Matthew 13, As for what was sown on good soil, this is one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundred folds, in other sixty, in other thirty. So what I'm saying with this scripture is, you know, what I believe just share, but a lot of times, we hear scripture, but it just, you know, comes this year, it comes out here. So the idea for us to be here today and to have our, bro our, our brother, you know, a pastor actually, sorry, uh, pastor share with us is, is to, to be obedient to the word of God. So let's make sure that, you know, we take that to heart. And I know that the flesh is going to say, no, let's, let's not do that. The devil is going to say the same thing. And the world is going to say the same thing. Let's not do that. Let's continue what we're doing. Okay? But that's the reason we, we just heard the word of God, so we can change our hearts. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for the word that you shared today. I know that uh, for some of us, you know, the, we, we listen to, to our flesh. We listen to, to the world, uh, Lord, and uh, we want to do what they're doing. But uh, as you... Uh, shared through our pastor today uh, that uh, we should focus more on you, Lord. And many of us need that reminder. So thank you for reminding us and helped us make that change in our hearts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.